Normal Show Live is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate for the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate or encourage any illegal activity and advise all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws by visiting normal.org, N-O-R-M-L dot org. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers of Normal Show Live are their own and do not necessarily reflect the philosophy and policies of Normal. Listener discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. From the promise of legalization. Uh, and I think we need to rethink and re-criminalize our marijuana laws. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws presents... Normal Show Live, Marijuana Nation. Now, here's your host, Normal's Outreach Coordinator, Radical Russ Belleville. Good afternoon, tokers and tokettes. Welcome. It is Monday, October 31st, 2011, and it's got to be Halloween all over the world. I'm Radical Russ Belleville, also known as a pothead. Get it? And welcome to the show. Glad to have you here for our Halloween show. All sorts of great stuff coming up on today's Normal Show Live. Going to give a call out here to Cannabis Carrie. She's just just getting on the line there uh, as I was looking over and getting started here on the show. We've got on today's show an extended radical rant on today's show. We got the answer from the drug czar, answer from the White House on our most popular petition on the WhiteHouse.gov We the People site. We got over 74,000 signatures on this. There were five of the top 10 petitions were about marijuana legalization. We got the answer from the White House. It's not a very good one. Yes, it's, you've read it already over the weekend. And, and they released it late on a Friday, so no one on the East Coast could report on it. But I was out here on the West Coast burning the midnight oil, and we got the answer uh, ready to go. So uh, we'll talk about that in the second half hour of today's show. It'll all be dedicated to the facts and figures that prove the drug czar is lying to you and giving you far more trick than treat in today's Halloween edition. Joining us from our virtual Virtual studio in beautiful Grastoria, Oregon, is the spooky Cannabis Carry. <laughs> yes, I am spooky today. Guess what I'm having for dinner tonight? Uh, pumpkin pie? Goulash. <laughs> very good. Oh, that's... Making it right now, I swear to God. <laughs> yeah, very good. So, <laughs> Cannabis Carry brings us our uh, hemp headlines right here at the top of the hour. So, what do we got in the news today? We've got a couple of stories today. One out of Canada that shows that uh, can- Canadian uh, medical marijuana patients are getting the shaft once again. Also, we're going to go to uh, California where the ASA is suing Eric Holder. And then we are also going to talk about that White uh, House petition response for those of you that can't stick around for the second hour. All right. Also, uh, there's some other news stories that I'd been uh, pulled up here. A story coming out of, let's see, uh, Reason Magazine's pointing out the Time Magazine. uh, Even Time Magazine has figured out this scare about, oh, no, your kids might end up with uh, uh, laced Halloween pot candies uh, is ridiculous so we'll talk about that also the mercury news on two dead one wounded in some uh, california pot farm uh, shootings unfortunately and uh, interesting news out of a survey from the uh, berkeley patients group about uh, medical marijuana and the use of prescription drugs so all that coming up in our news segment also on today's show it's roots monday and well since it's halloween i have to bring you the halloween stoner song of course from the toys monster hash it's coming your way at 20 after the hour so stick around it's normal show live the voice of the marijuana nation having ourselves a good time on halloween we're right back with the news after this this is normal show live the voice of the marijuana nation the law offices of omar figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights Please do not give up your precious liberties. 
There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the only way to honor the Constitution that gives us these precious rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all of my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search or seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak with my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at www.omarfigueroa.com. You're listening to Normal's Daily Audio Stash. Weedmaps.com I'm Radical Russ from Normal. In my job as outreach coordinator, I travel every month, and when I'm on the road, I need a fast, accurate way to find the medical marijuana dispensaries in the area. So I turn to Weedmaps.com. Weedmaps.com has the best dispensary locator online or on your mobile device. Search by zip code or let Weedmaps find you, and in seconds, you'll have the addresses, phone numbers, and customer service reviews for the medical marijuana dispensaries in the local area. Weedmaps.com also has a section devoted to helping you find a doctor who understands and recommends medical marijuana under your state's law. You can even check prices on the Medical Marijuana Stock Exchange. Coming soon, you'll even be able to find the listings of normal attorneys and chapters, local head shops and grow shops, and the best weed-friendly businesses. Weedmaps.com has the information you need to be an informed cannabis consumer. Visit Weedmaps.com today, a proud sponsor of the Normal Network. Inhaling deeply all the sacred smoke. Medical marijuana, industrial hemp, consumer cannabis. It's time for this week's Normal News with Cannabis Carry. Well, it's official. Our community has finally gotten a response from the White House. Well, the nation's drug czar, Gil Kurlikowski, answered for them anyway, so you can probably guess where they stand on the issue. Weeks ago, the White House launched a website called We the People as a tool to help the average citizen to post a petition for a request for government action. If the petitions that were posted got enough signatures, the White House promised a response to the issue. Like most Ask Your Politician polls and online questions town meetings, many people asked about legalizing marijuana. In this latest webline poll, almost 75,000 people signed online to get the White House to issue a response on legalization. There were four questions about marijuana in the top 10 most popular questions on the Weave People website. Eight marijuana issue questions received more than 5,000 signatures, signatures each, so the official response from the White House, which in this case was lobbed over to the director of the White House Office on National Drug Control Policy, our drug czar, Gil Kurlikowski, was no surprise, but nevertheless disappointing. Kurlikowski offered the official White House response to the questions. They chose to take a blanket approach to all the marijuana legalization questions in a response that they titled, What we have to say about legalizing marijuana. Kurlikowski starts off by reminding us of President Obama's policy of making decisions based on science and research, not ideology or politics. But then he focused on what he calls science when it comes to marijuana's effects. He uses the National Institute of Health as his science that shows that marijuana use is associated with addiction, respiratory diseases, and cognitive impairment. He says that marijuana use is a significant source for voluntary drug treatment admissions and also emergency room visits, stats that we have been debunking for years here on Normal Show Live. The rest of the statement reads like a who's who of felonious marijuana facts, such as the triple potency, not your Woodstock weed argument, and the negative effects on young brains. He did say that the White House is interested in the potential medicinal effects of marijuana and promises that they are, quote, ardently supporting ongoing research into determining what components of the marijuana plant can be used as medicine. But follows that with the FDA and the Institute of Medicine having not found that smoke marijuana can meet any modern standard for safe or effective medicine for any condition. Now, lastly, he did acknowledge that we cannot arrest our way out of the marijuana program or problem in our country and says that legalizing marijuana would not address any answers to health issues, social issues, youth education, criminal justice, or quality of life. He says drug addiction treatment is the most cost-effective way to reduce drug use in America and that the $10 billion spent on drug education and treatment programs is the best route, citing the use of drug courts in many states that allow treatment over jail sentences for first-time offenders. So, not from Obama, but yet another response from Gateway Gill. Yeah, let's remember here that the Office of National Drug Control Policy, the Office of Director, is designed by law, it's in the statute, to oppose 
all efforts at marijuana legalization for any reason whatsoever. It could even, you know, medical, doesn't matter. His job is to oppose it. It doesn't matter if we came down from on high with tablets etched by God that said you shall now legalize. The drug czar, by law, would have to say, eh, sorry, Moses, we can't do it. Can't legalize. Uh, it's bad. You know, drugs are bad. Uh, we can't legalize marijuana. Some terrible, terrible thing would happen if we were to do drugs that. Are bad. Yeah, see, you that's our official, official White House policy uh, here, you do them, set by Mr. Mackey. Because drugs are bad. Yeah. Okay. yeah, we'll talk a whole lot more about this in the second half hour. And the Medical Marijuana Advocacy Group, Americans for Safe Access, is trying to use the court system to try and stop the raids of dispensaries in the state of California. We've been covering the systematic threats, closures, and harassment of dozens of dispensaries in California following those letters sent out to landlords by the California U.S. attorneys earlier this month. The ASA, based in Oakland, is suing U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder, along with Melinda Haig, the top federal prosecutor in Northern California. The group is accusing them of violating the Constitution's 10th Amendment by using coercive and unfair tactics to interfere with the powers that are delegated to the states. The medical marijuana industry in California has been left reeling after expanding during the current administration, whose promise to end spending federal money to go after state program participants has fallen flat. The raids occurring on dispensaries is hearkened to the aggressive raids that occurred during the previous George Bush administration. Joe Elford, the chief counselor for the ASA, says that the aggressive attorneys are not just enforcing the medical marijuana law of the state of California, they are doing something unusual in their efforts to repress the medical marijuana program in the state. He added that U.S. attorneys are not allowed to commandeer the lawmaking functions for the state of California. The 17-page lawsuit was filed late last week. Different courts in the state have made different rulings on the matter since the initiative was passed back in 1996. A recent California appellate court ruled that municipalities can't authorize the cultivation or distribution of a federally controlled substance by way of licensing them. But other appellate courts in the state have ruled that federal laws do not trump state laws in this matter. The lawsuit cites several threats by the U.S. attorneys telling cities that they, uh, their officials could face federal prosecution for enacting medical marijuana policies in Chico, Eureka, and Arcata. The suit cites the specific case of federal raids this month in a collective in Mendocino County. The lawsuit notes that on behalf of 48-year-old collective member Mark Perillo, who suffers from chronic pain from a degenerative joint disease was deprived of his share of the harvest that police cut down and destroyed, denying Mr. Perillo of his medicine since no other delivery service provides medical marijuana at a low cost. California Attorney General Kamala Harris warned last week that an overly broad federal enforcement program will make it difficult for many California patients to have access to their physician-recommended medicine. She urged the feds to adhere to the U.S. Department of Justice policy issued back in 2009, the Holder Memo, that sticks to significant traffickers of illegal drugs. We hope that she wants them to leave the patients alone. Please leave the patients alone. You know, I, I'm glad this lawsuit's going forward because, like I always say, when we're talking about it, we're winning. When we make these lawsuits happen, they get headlines and it brings the attention to, you know, the absurdity of marijuana prohibition, especially when we're talking about sick people, for God's sake. But in looking at the suit, I, I don't know that there's going to be much uh, benefit. I, I don't know that it can win, is what I'm saying. There's a lot of benefit in it, a lot of benefit in bringing the issue forward, but I don't think it can win. It looks to me like another situation where the federal government can just point at the Rach decision and say, well, <laughs> Controlled Substances Act, Rach, we have the, the right to do all these things. And, and the idea of it being, well, the federal government has no business busting into the states here and, and strong arming them and using these tactics to get the states to do things a certain way that the states are supposed to be in control of. Well, the answer to that is the 1984 Minimum, wage, minimum uh, Drinking Age Act. Uh, this went through back when I was, you know, going through high school and all, which basically said that if a state didn't raise its drinking age from 18 or 19 to 21 that state would lose 10% of its federal highway funds, right? They didn't say the states had to raise their drinking age. They just made it so economically uh, burdensome for them to remain with an 18 or 19 year old drinking age that all the states eventually raise the age to 21. So it seems to me we have some precedent for federal strong arming of the states in matters that should be the, uh, the state's prerogative. I do hope this lawsuit can expose that and we can move forward on ending prohibition for everyone. 
And now we go to Canada for our next story. The medical marijuana program in Canada has been in place for more than a decade, but a recent study shows that most Canadian doctors are still refusing to sign the declarations patients need to get legal access to medical marijuana. Advocates in Canada are worried that recent proposed changes in the way that Health Canada regulates access to medical marijuana will make it even harder for patients in pain to get that legal access. Add to it recent mandatory minimum sentencing for drug crimes in Canada, and patients who can't find legal access to marijuana will be under threat of incarceration now. Health Canada's proposal, according to Health Canada, would be easing restrictions on access by removing themselves as the ultimate arbiter in approving or rejecting the applications in the process. Now, instead, doctors alone would sign off on the request. But even Canada's largest doctors group said the proposal would put an even greater pressure on doctors to control access to a largely untested, largely unregulated, and inconsistent substance that they learned little or nothing about in medical school or recommend a drug that hasn't gone through the normal regulatory review process like every other drug they prescribe. The licensing body has told their members that they are under no obligation to complete a medical declaration, the form a legal medical marijuana patient would need. They cautioned any doctors that do fill out the form to do so with caution. The Canadian Medical Association has 75,000 members, many who have expressed their fear over legal action or become a magnet for people who are seeking legal marijuana for recreational use. The doctors want some fundamental research into basic questions like who does it work for and who should be using medical marijuana. But since the current conservative government abruptly ended a medical marijuana research program back in 2006, those answers for doctors seeking science will remain unanswered for now. Health Canada says they believe that clinical research is best undertaken by the private sector, meaning pharmaceutical companies that will never evaluate smoked marijuana as medicine because there's no money in it for them. Now, we are watching a case in Ontario of a man who was found with a few marijuana plants. He was charged with production and manufacturing, but he was in constant pain from scoliosis, fibromyalgia, and uh, in, in, in epilepsy, excuse me, but he was unable to find any doctor to sign his form. He is suing in superior court that the federal marijuana laws of Canada actually hurt him and the program is unconstitutional since he was unable to obtain legal access even with his extensive medical problems. Now that case goes to court in March and you can bet we'll be following it for all our Canadian listeners. Yeah, this is a, a big mess here. I mean, as if Health Canada's medical marijuana system wasn't a big mess anyway. But let me give you an idea why this is bad. I mean, at first blush, you hear this, you say, well, wait a minute, you know, going from a central government being able to uh, 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 approve these uh, requ requests, going from that to having many doctors being able to re approve the requests, w wouldn't that be good, right? Having doctors be able to approve the request. Well, here's the problem is the doctors are afraid to approve the request. For comparison's sake, the state of Oregon has medical marijuana. We've got about 3.8 million people. The state, the, the country of Canada has about 33 million people. As of uh, between January 1st and, and October 25th of this year, 3,800 doctors have written applications for medical marijuana in the entire country of Canada. Here in the state of Oregon, we've got about 2,000 that have written. Uh, recommendations for medical marijuana. So half as many applications, but we have one tenth as many of the people, right? We got many more doctors supporting it. And Oregon is one of the states that's very, very uh, uh, progressive on the marijuana issue. Uh, so leaving this in the hands of doctors in the case of Canada, uh, sounds like it's going to be a, a bad situation for the patients. And speaking of Canada, an update here. Uh, Supreme Court of Nova Scotia has upheld a provincial decision to deny a man public funding for equipment to grow medical marijuana. Sam Riley went to the court to challenge a decision of the Assistance Appeal Board, which found the equipment was not a special need under provincial regulations. The board has also determined that his use of marijuana did not qualify for funding as a special need through the Department of Community Services. Uh, although medical equipment and although medical equipment and supplies certainly can fall within the definition of special need, it would be unreasonable to interpret the regulations in such a way that coverage of growing equipment could fall within that definition if the very product being grown had not received the same designation, end quote, the judge wrote in her decision released Monday, which is basically to say if your health Canada won't cover the price of marijuana, why should it cover the price of the grow equipment? Once again, another situation where marijuana, medical marijuana, is not treated like other medicines simply because it's considered illegal when used by healthy people. 
And one other quick news uh, update here. Uh, patients, uh, Berkeley Patients Group did a survey, and in this anonymous survey, 66% of the patients at the dispensary said that they use marijuana as a prescription drug substitute. Their reasons? Cannabis offered better symptom control with fewer side effects than did prescription drugs. Those with pain symptoms said that marijuana has less addiction potential than do opioids. Others said marijuana helped to reduce the dose of other medications. Amanda Ryman, PhD, the Director of Research and Social Services at the Berkeley Center, said, quote, Instead of having a pain medication, an anti-anxiety medication, and a sleep medication, they are able to use just cannabis, and that controls all of those symptoms, end quote. Almost 50% of those surveyed said they use cannabis two or three times per day. More than 75% of respondents said they use cannabis for psychiatric disorders, including bipolar, PTSD, depression, and anxiety. Well, just telling us more of what we already knew, that people are using a safer, non-toxic alternative to prescription medications. We're back with the Monster Hash. It's 20 after the hour, and we have to take a short break. If you know what I mean. Please support these sponsors who support Normal Show Live. Oh, have you ever met that funny repo man? A repo man. Have you ever met that funny repo man? A repo man. If he said he swam to China, he would say to South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that repo man. Alternative Medical Choices offers healthcare the way it should be. Easy to access, patient-centered, team-based, and quality-focused. We offer a variety of natural, affordable healthcare treatment options like primary care, group acupuncture, massage, and assistance with OMP registration. As a patient, you will have a team of experts working with you to make you the best you can be. Call Alternative Medical Choices at 503-288-5579 or check us out on the web at altmedchoices.com. Hey, hey, hey you, I saw that. Don't go teasing us all if you're not going to share. Loose lips cause rips. Never brag about your home grow, even if you're a legal medical grower. Starfish Designs, makers of the original Gandalf. I'm Radical Russ, and when I want to relax, I always have my 17-inch long original Gandalf from Starfish Designs nearby. The hand-blown borosilicate glass is strong and easy to clean, and the design is sleek and sophisticated. Starfish designs are available from Bend, Oregon at a glass retailer near you. For locations, call 541-788-GLASS. That's 541-788-4527. It's time for your daily toker tunes. The best in 420-friendly music from all genres that uplifts, entertains, and informs the public. Today we bring you tunes for Roots Monday, our celebration of the music that evolved into the popular modern music of today. We pick the best of blues, country, folk, and jazz with a 420 feel and serve it up for you every Monday. If you'd like to submit your song to be played on Normal Show Live, send it to us at stash at normal.org. Now here's some more great independent marijuana music for today's Daily Toker Tune. All right, right back and welcome to uh, Halloween here at Normal Show Live. I hope you guys are going to have a fun trick-or-treating evening, costume party, taking the kids out, whatever you may do. And uh, if you're looking to get the metal going, I encourage you to check out our recording from Friday night. We did the uh, the Normal Rocks with Herb Thrasher Halloween special. We recorded the first hour of it. It's available right now at our live.normal.org page. Uh, great metal music uh, that totally uh, will get you into the Halloween spirit, man. There's uh, some good stuff up there. Uh, check it out. Normal Rocks with Herb Thrasher, available at live.normal.org, the one-hour video, and uh, lots and lots of great metal music on that. Also, tonight on A Different View, a great episode of A Different View. We pre-recorded it so that the ladies could take their kids out uh, for their Halloween trick-or-treating, but we pre-recorded it last week, and it's an interview with uh, Cash Hyde's father, Mike Hyde. Uh, you know, Cash Hyde's the little boy. Uh, maybe some of you know him as America's youngest medical marijuana patient. He was like a, a year old when they uh, started using uh, cannabis to help treat his glioma, his brain tumor. Also, uh, uh, 
if I can remember the man's name, uh, oh, it's just on the tip of my tongue. I forgot the other two people who were on the show, but uh, an interview with three different parents that are uh, undergoing use of medical marijuana for their kids. Uh, one of the parents, their their child has the severe autism with the violent episodes, much like uh, Miko Hester Perez's child. Uh, and and uh, it's just an amazing uh, set of interviews that they've got on the show tonight. Check that out at 8 o'clock Pacific time, A Different View with Iva Cunningham, Jennifer Alexander, and Sarah Frank. So great shows coming up tonight on the Normal Network. Now coming up here for our 20 after musical break, we're going to give you some music that's the holiday Halloween favorite. It's the uh, old standard Monster Mash. You remember, may remember that tune from the uh, the uh, airwaves uh, from that all the way back in the '60s. I think that same song came out. But this uh, next tune is a parody of it, done by the Toys, who also have some other great tunes. But this one is the Toys with uh, Monster Hash. So uh, let's get that uh, plan here on the old Liebermater and enjoy uh, the Toys Monster Hash. And it doesn't want to play for me. Okay, going to be that way, are you? <laughs> okay, hold on. We'll bring this back up. Ah, oh, there we go. Monster Hash, kick it. Definitely having a Halloween here, aren't we? <laughs> I was working in the lab late one night When I heard the gurgle of a water pipe So I turned to see my monster in a cloud of smoke Who said, this shit ain't bad, here, have a toast We smoke some hash We smoke some monster hash Some monster hash It was his personal stash We smoke some hash We got completely trapped A monster hash we smoked some monster hash As we parted in the castle with the living dead Mouths were dry and eyes were red The ghouls and goblins shrieked and screamed Won't somebody please pass the visine? They smoked some hash They smoked some monster hash Some monster hash From Frankie's personal staff We smoked some hash And they all were smashed A monster hash they smoked some monster hash The mummy was toking on a bong The wolfman said don't bogart that, pass it along The swamp thing was toasted, rolling on the floor Laughing hysterically and pleading for more The scene was rocking as the werewolves moved To the undead reggae band's dance hall grooves Meanwhile in the kitchen, Frankenstein begged some Alice B. Toklas Brownies and cakes. We ate some hash. We ate some monster hash. Some monster hash. It had the graveyard smash. We ate some hash. And we all got trapped. A monster hash. We ate some monster hash. The party would have gone on till we all passed out. But just then we heard a blood curdling shout. Watch out! Beware! Cover your necks! Dracula's got the munchies and he's totally wrecked. He smoked some hash. He smoked some monster hash. Some monster hash. He was completely smashed. He smoked some hash. That Transylvanian's trash. A monster hash. He smoked some monster hash. Now every night the dead rise up from the grave To partake in a happening THC rave For you, the living, this hash was meant to When you get to my door, just say the toys sent you We'll smoke some hash We'll smoke some monster hash Some monster hash And we'll all get trashed We'll smoke some hash From my personal staff A monster hash We'll smoke some monster hash uh, smoking some monster hash tonight on Halloween. Have yourself a safe evening. When we come back, we're going to break down the drug czar's response to Normal's petition on marijuana legalization. Stick around. It's Normal Show Live. You want a copy of that song for your iPod? Check out the Daily Toker tunes at the Stash blog by surfing to stash.normal.org and choosing media and then Toker tunes from the main menu. This is Normal Show Live. As regards to legalization, it's not in the president's vocabulary and it's not in mine. 
providing dictionaries to drug czars since 2009. I don't care what you say. That ain't right. I said, that ain't right. That ain't right. I don't care what you say. As High Times Senior Cultivation Editor, I'm often called into the field and asked to sample or even identify exotic strains of marijuana in their natural habitat. Now, for the first time, I've compiled more than 120 of my favorite strains into this single field guide designed to fit into your pocket as you travel the world in search of your favorite plant. From a friend's closet grow room to the wilds of Northern California, this single guide covers all of today's best known strains, plus heirlooms and throwbacks, including High Times quality photos and information on each variety's genetic heritage and growing characteristics, plus my personal notes on aroma, flavor, and potency. So this is Danny Danko, author of the official High Times Field Guide to Marijuana Strains, wishing you good times and great ganja. The official High Times Field Guide to Marijuana Strains is available at hightimes.com and finer bookstores. That chronic make me paranoid, baby. What makes something funny? How does humor impact health and psychological well-being? How can you incorporate humor into everyday life? A concise, reader-friendly introduction to an important but often underappreciated topic in modern psychology, Humor 101 explains the role of comedy, jokes, and wit in the sciences and discusses why they are so important to understand. Psychology professor Dr. Mitch Earlywine draws from his personal experiences in stand-up comedy to focus on how humor can regulate emotion, reduce anxiety, and diffuse tense situations, expose pretensions, build personal relationships, and much more. He irreverently debunks the pseudoscience on the topic of humor and leaves readers not only funnier, but better informed. It's part of the Psych 101 series from Springer Publishing, Humor 101, by Dr. Mitch Earlywine, Ph.D. You want answers? I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! And you have offended a Shaolin Temple. You can't handle the truth! Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Hoorah! Well, the Obama White House has released its official response to the We the People online petition for marijuana legalization submitted by Eric Altieri, our communications director at Normal. The petition, which garnered 74,169 signatures, was by far the most popular petition submitted. Five of the top ten petitions submitted address the case of legalizing marijuana. The government response to our to our petition, as well as seven others that it put together uh, that were all marijuana legalization petitions, the response to all of them repeats the same tired lies and classic misdirections. Also, as a bonus, it was released late on Friday after the East Coast newsmen had all gone to bed, uh, leaving me out here in the Pacific Coast to uh, stay up till about four in the morning writing up this response for normal. Uh, we are not going to let it slide. You're not going to put it on the weekend news dump and expect it to just gloss right over. And most of all, it fails to answer normal's actual petition. Let me get you back to our original actual petition on the We the People website. Quote, Legalize and regulate marijuana in a manner similar to the alcohol. We the people want to know when we can have our perfectly legitimate discussion on marijuana legalization. Marijuana prohibition has resulted in the arrest of over 20 million Americans since 1965, countless lives ruined, and hundreds of billions of tax dollars squandered. And yet, this policy has still failed to achieve its stated goals of lowering use rates, limiting the drug's access, and creating safer communities. Isn't it time to legalize and regulate marijuana in a manner similar to alcohol? If not, explain why you feel the continued criminalization of cannabis will achieve the results in the future that it has never achieved in the past. So that was our official question. Isn't it time to regulate marijuana like alcohol? If not, how is doing the same thing we've been doing for 40 years going to work any different, right? Two-part question. Well, here is the official White House response, word for word, all of it, not going to cut any of it out. 
but I'm going to put Normal's response to it in between. Here we go. This is from the drug czar. What we have to say about legalizing marijuana by Gil Kurlikowski. When the president took office, he directed all of his policymakers to develop policies based on science and research, not ideology or politics. So our concern about marijuana is based on what the science tells us are the drug's effects. Oh, oh great. Then we're really looking forward to you implementing the 1972 Schaefer Commission report. You know, when Nixon declared this war on drugs back in the 1970s, he tried originally to get science on his side to back him up. He commissioned the Schaefer Commission, headed by a Republican ex-governor of Pennsylvania, Raymond P. Schaefer. They took a deep look at the issues of marijuana legalization, and they recommended that it should be decriminalized, that the criminalization of marijuana caused more harm to society than the use of it, and Nixon threw that in the dumpster. So we've been hearing for 40 years the attempts by the government to put some scientific backing to its prohibitionist policy, and we're not buying it. Now, to continue with uh, Mr. Kurlikowski, according to scientists at the National Institutes of Health, the world's largest source of drug abuse research, marijuana use is associated with addiction, respiratory disease, and cognitive impairment. All right, well, addiction links to a National Institutes of Drug Abuse page that notes the lifetime dependency rate of cannabis is 9%. Now, what that means is 9 out of 100 people who try cannabis will eventually develop a dependence on it. Kurlikowski does not mention that caffeine has the same 9% rate, alcohol is a 15% rate, and tobacco is a 32% rate. He also fails to mention that those scientists at NIDA took a look at the addictive effects, the properties of various substances, and how addictive they were, they were. And they found that cannabis was about equal to caffeine in its level of addictiveness when we speak of dependence, withdrawal, tolerance, and reinforcement, and only slightly more dangerous when it came to its intoxication levels. Now, Kurlikowski also fails to mention in here that this withdrawal, this rare withdrawal that the very few people who get a dependence on cannabis, this withdrawal is characterized by the Institute of Medicine as, quote, mild and short-lived, and, quote, includes restlessness, irritability, mild agitation, insomnia, sleep disturbance, nausea, and cramping, end quote. Not exactly like kicking heroin and possibly dying of the withdrawals. In fact, not even like alcohol, Mr. Drugs are. You do know that withdrawal from alcohol can kill a person. And it's legal, right? Now, the link that he gives us to respiratory disease links to a 2008 Science Daily article on a study entitled Bolus Lung Disease Due to Marijuana, which looked at the cases of 10... 10 people who came in already complaining of lung problems who admitted they smoked pot over the past year. The subject was featured in a Journal of Royal Society of Medicine article as it found, quote, insufficient evidence for a causative link, end quote. And Matthew Naughton, the author of that 2008 study, co-authored a 2011 study which noted, quote, unfortunately, it is difficult to separate marijuana use from tobacco smoking, which does confound these reports, end quote. And speaking of tobacco, Mr. Drugzar, you, you do know that tobacco is much worse for the lungs, and it's legal, right? And the last part, when he says cognitive impairment, cognitive impairment links to a 1996 National Institutes of Drug Abuse uh, fact sheet on the studies of, card uh, of cognitive impairment that involved a task of card sorting, how well you could sort a bunch of playing cards. Now, since 1996, we've seen in 2001, a study published in the Archives of General Psychiatry that found chronic users who quit for a week, quote, showed no significant differences from control subjects, end quote. A 2002 clinical trial published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal determined, quote, marijuana does not have long-term negative impact on global intelligence, end quote. A 2003 meta-analysis published in the Journal of International Neuropsychological Society also, quote, failed to reveal a substantial systemic, 
systematic effect of long-term regular cannabis consumption on the neurocognitive functioning of users who are not acutely intoxicated, end quote. A 2004 study of twins published in the journal Psychological Medicine reported, quote, an absence of marked long-term residual effects of marijuana on cognitive abilities, end quote. A 2005 study published in the American Journal of Addictions used magnetic resonance imaging and found, quote, no significant differences, end quote, between heavy cannabis smokers compared to controls. A 2006 study published in the uh, German journal Psychopharmacology found, quote, no long-term deficits in working memory and selective attention in frequent cannabis users after one week of abstinence, end quote. A 2009 study published in Human Psychopharmacology found, quote, little indication of differences in executive functioning, end quote, for mild to moderate cannabis users. And a 2010 study, the most recent study that we have on this, published in Pharmacology, Biochemistry, and Behavior, found regular cannabis users' performance accuracy on episodic memory and working memory tasks, quote, was not significantly altered by marijuana. And that's just the eight I could find in my spare time. And forgive the overkill, but normal as an organization that is honored to have Carl Sagan's widow, Anne Dryan, as an advisory board member. And Carl Sagan, one of the smartest human beings to ever have walked planet Earth, was a frequent cannabis com consumer. We are particularly offended when the government claims science says that regular cannabis consumers are stupid. And speaking of cognitive impairment, Mr. Drug Czar, are you aware that frequent alcohol use is shown to have incredibly deleterious effects on cognition and it's legal? But our petition wasn't about whether or not cannabis is harmful. It was whether or not we should consider regulating cannabis like the far more harmful substances, alcohol and tobacco. We'll continue on with our debunking of the drug czar and response to our petition when we come back at Normal Show Live. The fact is today... People don't go to jail for possession of marijuana. I know you like to pretend it does, and there's a lot of misinformation about that, but um, finding somebody in jail or prison for a first-time nonviolent offender for possession of marijuana is like finding a unicorn. You find one, you will make a big story because it doesn't exist. Finding somebody in jail or prison for a first-time nonviolent offender for possession of marijuana is like finding a unicorn, finding a unicorn, finding a unicorn. Normal Show Live, the National Wildlife Refuge for Marijuana Unicorns. I'm gonna light me a pipe of inspiration. I'm gonna blow away the holes on my head. I'm gonna leave this plastic place to your plastic beaveries. And travel to a better place. And travel to a better place. And travel to a better place instead. It's tough talking to kids about marijuana, especially if you might be a parent who dabbled a time or two in your youth. So to help you out, get your copy of Dr. Mitch Earlywine's latest book, A Parent's Guide to Marijuana. Dr. Earlywine is an associate professor of psychology at the State University of New York at Albany and an expert on the studies concerning marijuana, its effect on health and society, and the methodology behind the statistics. He is a frequent guest here on our daily audio stash. Dr. Earlywine lays it all out without the propaganda and scare tactics that parents know won't work with teenagers. He presents a rational understanding of cannabis, what it is and what it isn't, and why kids shouldn't be using marijuana. You can order today through Amazon.com or check our links at our blog, stash.normal.org. <laughs> Ya no puede caminar. You're listening to porque Normal no Show Live. Porque le falta <laughs> marihuana que fumar. You chip it. The voice of the Marijuana Nation. Hear Cannabis Times Radio every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific with replays at 11 p.m. Pacific. Also catch morning replays every Thursday at 5 a.m. Pacific and weekend replays every Sunday at 7 a.m. Pacific right here on the Normal Network. Marijuana and alcohol are the two most popular recreational drugs in America. Marijuana smoking is non-toxic, relatively safe, and has a low risk of dependence. 
Coors after Coors. Alcohol drinking is potentially fatal, dangerous to society, and is quite addictive. Marijuana is safer, so why are we driving people to drink? That's the question of the new book, Marijuana is Safer, So Why Are We Driving People to Drink? by Paul Armentano, Mason Tavert, and Steve Fox. Visit Amazon.com or ChelseaGreen.com today to order your copy of Marijuana is Safer or visit MarijuanaIsSafer.com. Welcome back. We're continuing the radical rant here on the drug czar's response, the official White House response to Normal's most successful petition on the We the People petition site. And it's important to remember, this is not the first time that they've had to respond to us. This is the ninth time Ninth time they've opened it up for questions from the American people, and for the ninth time, marijuana legalization is placed in the top ten. It's dominated the top ten in most all of these cases. And once again, we get the same tired responses from the drug czar. Uh, I already debunked the first response about marijuana being addictive, causing respiratory disease and cognitive impairment. Let me continue on with the next part of the drug czar's rhetoric here. He says, quote, we know from an array of treatment admission information and federal data that marijuana use is a significant source for voluntary drug treatment admissions and visits to emergency rooms. Oh, voluntary admissions, eh? Well, really nice of you to link to that table because it's a table that actually makes my point for me. The uh, 2000 said treat, 2007 treatment episode data set, this is something called TEDS, those data tables actually show us that 37% of the people admitted to treatment for marijuana hadn't used it in the past 30 days. More than one out of three people you're putting in a forced rehab hadn't even smoked pot in a month. These tables are based on admissions data that also show us that 57% of marijuana admissions were coerced by law enforcement, either through a drug court or some sort of judge sentencing them to that treatment, and only 15% of such admissions are actually voluntary drug treatment admissions. 13.09% of the referrals of cannabis only. When it comes to cannabis only, it's near 60% are referrals from the criminal justice system. Nearly three out of five cannabis users in rehab right now are there because a court forced them there. This is not anything... So so what we have here is... A, well, let me get to the next part. He talks about visits to emergency rooms, right? So visits to emergency rooms. This links to 2009 data from the uh, Drug Abuse Warning Network, something called DAWN, and this contains a little bit of interesting fine print that says, quote... Within Dawn, the drug misuse or abuse statistics uh, category is a group of emergency room visits defined broadly to include all visits associated with illicit drugs. That is, if you mention pot, if you have pot on you, or your urine or blood test positive for pot, that's a drug-related emergency room visit. Has nothing to do with people going in and saying, oh my god, I smoked pot and now I feel awful. It has to do with whether or not people who feel awful happen to be pot smokers. If you smoked a bowl last night, broke your leg skiing today, went to the ER, and they found metabolites of THC in your pee, well, that's a dawn statistic for a pot-related ER visit. Meanwhile, a 2011 study in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine found, quote, marijuana dependence was associated with the lowest rates, end quote, of emergency room admittance compared to other drugs. So, we have illegal marijuana, which lets the government arrest people and then make them choose between jail or rehab, and then the rehab numbers go up, and that's an indication we need to keep arresting people. And we have emergency room data that tells us that some sick and injured people, like some Americans generally, smoke pot. Can you tell us why we shouldn't end those charades and consider regulating cannabis like the more harmful alcohol and tobacco? The drugs are continuous. Studies also reveal that marijuana potency has almost tripled over the past 20 years, raising serious concerns about what this means for public health, especially among young people who use the drug because research shows their brains continue to develop well into their 20s. Simply put, it is not a benign drug. 
Well, the part that he says marijuana potency has tripled links to a 2010 paper from the Ole Miss U.S. Pot Farm. Y you do know the federal government grows pot, right? The federal government actually grows pot at the University of Mississippi. And this terribly dangerous drug that nobody should have and has no medical benefit, they, they roll it up and they mail nine ounces of it to a pound of it a month to four Americans for medical purposes. You know that, right? That we have a U.S. government pot farm. Anyway, so they did the research at the U.S. government pot farm and this uh, potency paper that they uh, link to shows potency tables from 1993 to 2008. Yeah, that's, you're right. That's 15 years, not 20 years, Mr. Drugs are, but you know, yeah, 15 years, 20 years, whatever. Uh, now, these figures also include hashish and hash oil. And for those of you who don't know, those are concentrated preparations of cannabis. This is kind of like throwing three Rhodes Scholars into an eighth grade social studies class and then grading on the curve. It's apples and oranges here. Hash is not pot. You could take the swaggiest weed in the world and if you had enough of it, make hash oil that'll knock you on your ass because it's a concentrated preparation. So adding hash into the, the potency figures uh, it makes that a little bit fuzzy on the math there. But let's go on with your math here. Figures for all samples including the hash we just talked about, show a rise from 3.4% to 8.8% THC. That, my friends, is two and a half times. That's not almost triple. Uh, but if you separate it out, take the hash part out, for what they call marijuana, just average grade marijuana, that goes from 3.4% to 5.8%. And that would be, uh, what, 1.7 times greater? Not even double. And what they call sensimilia, you know, fine grade pot, goes from 5.8% to 11.5% THC. Now that is just about double, but nowhere near triple that he mentioned. So let's, let's recap this. Today's average marijuana is about twice as good as yesterday's sensimilia. And today's average sensimilia is about twice as good as yesteryear's sensimilia. Anybody recall any deaths, riots, or serious social disorder due to the sensimilia of 1993? Look, as we've said before, potency is irrelevant because cannabis smoking is a self-titrating behavior. You smoke to get high. If you have ditch weed, you smoke a lot of it to get high. If you have kind bud, you smoke a little of it to get high. Since you're smoking less, less smoke in your lungs, that's a good thing. And by that measure, smoking more potent marijuana may be a harm reduction strategy. Besides, it's kind of hard to take seriously any concerns the government might have about non-toxic 11.5% THC sensimilia when they approve of a 100% synthetic THC Marinol pill and Marinol, marijuana of any potency has never killed anyone. But again, once again, Mr. Drug Czar, nobody here said cannabis was a benign drug, only that it was safer than the two current legal substances, alcohol and tobacco. And we were just wondering, why couldn't we regulate cannabis like we regulate those? The drug czar continues. Like many, we are interested in the potential marijuana may have in providing relief to individuals diagnosed with certain serious illnesses. That is why we ardently support ongoing research onto determining what components of the marijuana plant can be used as medicine. To date, however, neither the FDA nor the Institute of Medicine have found smoked marijuana to meet the modern standard for safe or effective medicine of any condition for any condition. Yeah. Well, listen here. That ardent support that he's talking about consists of six ongoing FDA-approved clinical trials, two of which have already been completed, and that's worldwide, involving subjects' use of actual cannabis, and there are only 14 researchers allowed to study inhaled cannabis on human subjects. It does not include a recent FDA-approved study of, human, of medical marijuana to treat post-traumatic stress in our returning combat veterans. That study was ardently opposed by the NIDA, which wouldn't sell any of the Ole Miss U.S. pot farm marijuana for the researchers to study. Furthermore, a NIDA spokesperson admitted to the New York Times in 2010, quote, As the National Institute on Drug Abuse, our focus is primarily on the negative consequences of marijuana use. We generally do not fund research focused on the potential beneficial medical effects of marijuana, end quote. 
Yeah. That's that's your ardent support. Right. Now, the links he gives you, the FDA and the Institute of Medicine links, take you to papers from 2006 and 1999, respectively. Meanwhile, the American Medical Association in 2009 released a position paper where they stated, smoked cannabis improves neuropathic pain, improves appetite, I'm sorry, reduces neuropathic pain, improves appetite and caloric intake, especially in patients with reduced muscle mass, and may relieve spasticity and pain in patients with multiple sclerosis, end quote. So we don't buy the marijuana isn't medical argument anymore. Even the doctors of the AMA don't buy it anymore. Now, it's too bad our petition wasn't about carving exceptions to federal law to allow the medical use of marijuana as 70% of Americans support it was whether we should regulate marijuana like we do alcohol and tobacco like 50% of America supports the drug czar continues as a former police chief I realize that we cannot arrest our way out of this problem (laughs) <laughs> yeah, if you realize that, then why were there virtually the same number of arrests this year for marijuana as there were last year for marijuana, a number that still eclipse any arrest totals under Presidents Bush and Clinton? It seems you're going out of your way to ignore our petition to end that strategy of arresting our way out of the problem by regulating marijuana like we regulate alcohol and tobacco. The drugs are continues. We also recognize that legalizing marijuana would not provide the answer to any of the health, social, youth education, criminal justice, and community quality of life challenges associated with drug use. Right. Legalizing marijuana won't address drug use. It will address marijuana use by regulating it like we do alcohol and tobacco. Legal marijuana would be an answer to many Americans' health challenges. Legal marijuana would help raise tax revenues to benefit society and community. Legal marijuana would replace the reefer madness-style youth education that's been proven not to work with honest, factual information. Legal marijuana removes the cost of arresting, prosecuting, and monitoring people on parole and probation, and by definition, eliminates crime. The drug czar continues. The... President, that, that is why the president's national drug control strategy is balanced and comprehensive, emphasizing prevention and treatment while at the same time supporting innovative law enforcement uh, efforts that protect public safety and disrupt the supply of drugs entering our communities. This president's budget is only slightly different than the drug control budgets of his predecessor, still a two to one tilt s- towards supply reduction which is interdiction and domestic and international law enforcement versus demand reduction, which is treatment and prevention. That takes us to the second part of our petition, which was asking, how is the continued criminalization of cannabis going to achieve the results in the future that it has never achieved in the past? The drug czar continues. Preventing drug use is the most cost-effective way to reduce drug use and its consequences in America. And, as we've seen in our work through the community coalitions across the country, this approach works in making communities healthier and safer. We're also focused on expanding access to drug treatment for addicts. Treatment works. In fact, millions of Americans are in successful recovery for drug and alcoholism today. Drug and alcoholism? Ah, never mind. And through our work with innovative drug courts across the nation, we are improving access to treatment. Uh, We are improving our criminal justice system to divert nonviolent offenders into treatment. Well, you can go back to our rebuttal about the treatment admission statistics and forcing people into rehab in the drug courts and bless all the people who were managed to get successful recovery from alcoholism and drug (laughs) who didn't miss out on a bed because there was some cannabis consumer forced there who hadn't smoked pot in a month. But these drug courts only work thanks to the arrests of cannabis consumers, and we're wondering how the continued criminalization of cannabis is going to achieve the results in the future that it has never achieved in the past. You continue to dodge the question. The drugs are continues. Our commitment to a balanced approach to drug control is real. 
This last fiscal year alone, the federal government spent over $10 billion on drug education and treatment programs compared to just over $9 billion on drug-related law enforcement in the U.S. Well, there's the trick there, as he says, drug-related inf enforcement in the U.S. doesn't count the 5 or $6 billion that we sent overseas in our drug enforcement. So we're continuing here. How does the continued criminalization of cannabis achieve the results in the future it has never achieved in the past? And the drug czar concludes... Thank you for making your voice heard. I encourage you to take a moment to read about the president's approach to drug control to learn more. Well, you know what? I've read it all. Thanks for wasting America's time and ignoring her wishes. I encourage you to take a moment to actually read and answer the questions on these petitions. Every answer you gave to whether we should consider regulating cannabis far, like the far more harmful substances alcohol and tobacco was an excuse to make alcohol and tobacco prohibited like marijuana. Every answer you gave to how will the continued criminalization of cannabis achieve the results in the future that it has never achieved in the past illustrated that you're continuing the same failed strategies as your predecessors. We the people were hoping for some change. We love the earth. This is Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. I'm Radical Russ, and I'm truly a pothead for Cannabis Carry and everybody here. Thanks for joining us. Have yourself a happy Halloween. And until next time, take care of each other, tokers.